Let's go to block grafts. My favorite harvesting area is here. It's the Reed Romona region. And if I harvest here the bone, I do it 100% with the piezo. And in cases where I have severe bone loss, I really rely on those block grafts because um, with particulate material, it would be very unlikely to regain the bone. So here's one example, one clinical example that you can see. Here's a video, I hope that this will run, <clears throat> where <clears throat> we harvested the bone with the piezo. It's very easy, I do just a single incision inside the bone. <clears throat> I take out the bone block, it takes probably five minutes, and then this bone block is <clears throat> fixed with two screws. I get rid of the sharp edges with the, uh, with the tip. And here you see that we are able to regain the bone. Uh, and even though we have a nice bone quantity, I add here during implant place placement another bone substitute material just to make, to thicken out. It's like you need to think, like make it as big as possible. Um, of course, allograft blocks are <clears throat> another alternative. I use them um, in abundance and still do in cases where I need to really graft big sites. So one thing is that you are unlimited in volume of the bone uh, substitute material. So even in those very big areas that needs to be graft, grafted, I, I, I don't need to uh, harvest it from, a, from the donor side of the patient. We wait here four to five months before we start to uh, load this bone with implants. We know that the literature is, is pretty limited with allogenic blocks, but uh, what we have is showing that we can use it as a successfully technique. But this is the worst case scenario. This is a, a case I did. And what was going wrong in here, a wrong or not a full effective manipulation of the soft tissue. And that's so important because if, if this bone ex is exposed, you don't need to think about like to, to graft it again or put membranes upon, upon this, this will never heal in. So we should avoid this while, uh, while using what I call the scissor prep. And the scissor prep is just a separation of the periosteum from the epiperiosteal connective tissue. So when I need to graft here this side, I do a full flap with releasing incisions that are going beyond the macrogingival line. Then I take a scissor and I do a separation of the periosteum, which will see, be seen here, and the epiperiosteal connective tissue. So you go from one side to the other. Once you've exited here with your scissor, the other side, you can see that everything that is now laying on the scissor is purely periosteum. And if you do here now the incision, you cut purely periosteum, no nerves and no blood vessels that are in the connective tissue because this is causing a massive swelling and a massive bleeding. I do this prior to any augmentative, augmentative surgery because then I can fix this flap uh, to the cheek. I have a very good visibility to my operation site and um, I don't need to manipulate this flap when I am about to finish my surgery. Another technique is a flap release of the lingual area in the mandibula. Um, you see here, we did a bone splitting here and it was not possible to raise the flap um, and or to cause a primary wound closure of this area um, with the buckle side. So what we did was you do a gentle preparation with sterile, uh, let's say butts, where you push down you push down the soft tissue here towards the millohead line where the millohead muscle is inserting. You see those fibers very clearly when you push this tissue down. 
And once you've pushed this down and you see those fibers of the muscles, you can take a tweezer and as I say, always like you play the violin, you go with the, with the blunt, with the blunt uh, tweezer alongside those exposed fibers and you tear a little bit with another surgical teaser, this flap region here, and you will see that you will expand the flap more and more and more. You can gain here up to one centimeter of flap with this very simple and very safe technique. Here is one case where we did an allograft block grafting uh, with the so-called pin latch technique. So we created a latch with the piezo, buckly from the area where we needed to graft. I took an allograft block and separated the sponges bone from the cortical plate. This cortical plate is later used as the outline for my new graft or for my new, um, for my new crest. So you can see here, this is the, the latch we created. And here the, the thin plate is fixed because it allows to stay very stable, not to flip, gives nutrition in this area to the apical part of the, um, of the thin bone. And here, this void is filled with the particulate material of the sponges area of the bone block mixed with slowly resolvable particulate material from any material that you use. What we do is we cause here like little holes inside the bone to provoke a bleeding. Why do we do this? Because out of these holes, we have bleeding from intraosseous blood vessels with a very high amount of um, pregenitor cells, stem cells, and growth factors. So we give another physiological cellular stimulation to our craft. Important here is mandatory is a very good primary wound closure that we don't expose this grafted area. Here you see the mental nerve. This is our buckle plate of the uh, bone block. Here you see a little bit of the latch remaining and after a couple of months, after four months, the patient returned back. You see here the screw that we take out. This is before, this is after, and this is what I want to obtain. Here is the buckle plate completely incorporated with the recipient side. This is sponges bone uh, that is showing a nice bleeding. So it's very, very vital bone. And here's the lingual plate. This is what I want to achieve. Another case in the lower, very compromised bone, big defect here, two bone blocks directly screwed to the recipient site. We added some particulate material, placed a PRF membrane upon it and achieved here again with the same technique, a primary wound closure with a continuous mattress suture. Returning back after five months, you see here nice bone, vital bone, uh, extraordinary expanded in width. We take out those screws and replace the implants. Tunnel technique provided by Kent 1982 is going back to the same principle of the intact periosteum that does release those progenitor cells. Uh, I was explaining previously. So we do a vertical incision and we create a pouch, a pocket we create a full flap in this area. It's not a full flap, but it's a full flap preparation. And once we have created this void, you can scratch the buccal area a little bit to provoke another bleeding, giving new cell stimulation to the graft. At that days, I was doing it with a material called Easy Graft. Uh, it's a biolinked um, beta TCP and hydroxyapatite material. And the bile anchor is making this very rigid after 30 seconds to one and a half minute. So you can mold it with your fingers. It's, it's setting after one and a half minute. It's getting brickstone hard. So you need to be a little bit fast, but then you can mold it 
uh, place it there where you want and it stays there. You don't need any additional membrane because if you leave the periosteum intact, it is staying stable. Here you see the area that was grafted, but again, Today, I go more and more to this biological protocol where I use this sticky bone um, with the PRF mixed um, and I have the same results. Importance of the soft tissue is in bone grafting procedure, procedures is super, super, super important. And one take home message for you guys today is if the biotype is bad, in areas where you want to graft, convert it first into a good one. We know that the biotype of the, of the gingiva is mandatory for a good result in grafted areas. The thinner the gingiva layer upon the bone is, the higher is the risk, risk that you will have and the higher is the failure rate that you will undergo. So one thing is, to thicken out the soft tissue. Here you can see one case, a young lady where we needed to take out those two central incisors. She had here apical processes. She was having permanent consisting pain and she asked me for an implant restoration. We start with minimal invasive atraumatic extraction of those two teeth, no flaps, 100% flapless, and then we maintain all the integrity of the soft and the hard tissues. We place in here the two implants and what I do then is I create a pouch with a very uh, small instrument and I separate the periosteum from the bone. I create a pouch to introduce here a collagenous material in this case, it is fibroguide provided by Geistlich company. You can take any collagen uh, that is working in your hands or a connective tissue if you would like, but I want to expand here the width of the soft tissue. The soft tissue is so important in conjunction with, the, with any bone grafting uh, protocol. You see here a very uneventful healing after a couple of weeks. This was uh, before, this was after six weeks. Here we have the two implants in place. And then we start after three months, uh, we loaded those implants with the temporary uh, splinted crowns on temporary abutments. These are peak abutments. And we loaded those two implants prematurely and what we do here is I injected hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is working beautifully in my hands to enhance soft tissue as well. You see here a beautiful healing after five months. Very nice integrity of the soft tissues. Here are the two implants in place with the abutments. These are the final abutments uh, made out of zirconia, the two screws. And here, the final two crowns. That's the result after six months. Very nice integrity of the soft tissues, uh, like creating even a papilla here um, around the implants and very nice integrity. I will come soon to finalize my presentation with the IntraLift, which is uh, our, our, our big ship uh, that we invented now, I think 12 years ago. And the infralift is called the hydrodynamic ultrasonic crystal sinus lift technique. And we do this every single day. It has replaced the lateral window technique to 99.9%. .9%, and I do this even with immediate implants at the same situation or delayed implants when we just graft this. But this can replace the whole lateral window technique completely. As you can see here, we have remaining 1.6 millimeters. We have here after the infralift gained 13.6 millimeters. Important is that the augmented area is going in wide enough to the medial aspect of this site because this is some, something I see very often that it's more 
buckly, you see the material and this is a problem. This is what you can see when you have very little bone. This is a remaining bone height of 1.5 millimeters. After the elevation that is done by the um, trumpet, by the TKW5, you see during expiration and inspiration of floating membrane. So you graft this side with the material that is working in your hands. This is what I want to see the next day on my when my patients return back. No swelling, no bruising, no complaints, no pain, not the necessity of antibiotics because we have very, very small access to the augmentative sites. But we need to have a 3D analysis of the sinus. I want to know if there is septums, from, um, like 1910 uh, explained by Underwood, if those septums are vertical, if those septums are horizontal, I don't have a problem if they're horizontals, but we need to analyze the bone structure. I need to have a clear view of the sinus mucosa. And you cannot estimate the Schneider membrane with a normal uh, 2D scan. What is the technique? We go with our drills um, or with the piezo tips to the sinus floor. I like this SCA kit, the Sinus Crest Approach Kit, provided, for instance, by Neobiotech. This is a blunt drill with stoppers, and they go in one millimeter steps. So with these stoppers, you can go very safe towards the, towards the sinus wall. You can open the sinus with not causing a rupture of the membrane, which is super important. That's the kit. And this is um, the, these are the bursts. So whenever these traps are filled here with the bone, this is a complete blunt burr. And it is not cutting, but it's like pushing a little bit inside the sinus floor uh, area with not causing a trauma to the Schneiderian membrane. That's a case from 2012. You see here a very extensive sinus, very little remaining bone upon this, uh, the sinus floor. So once we have a situation like this, I do create two osteotomies with the piezo. And then first we fill, we start to fill with collagen or with PRF just to place something as a buffer on top to provide any micro trauma or macro trauma to the Schneider membrane. Then we fill it. This is the result. You see here a very huge augmentation of this area, 12 grams we place in here of a, of a bovine material. And of course, then you need to wait a little bit longer, six to eight months prior to any implant placement. So when we have a situation like this, we create two osteotomies in a distance of 1.5 centimeters. And then you can do bilaterally the lifting of the Schneiderian membrane. You see here the TKW5 in place that is creating with the cavitation effect that I will explain soon, a lift of this area. So what is the cavitation effect? We have ultrasound uh, frequency that is based beyond 80 kilohertz. Cavitation needs 10 watt per centimeter. And once we have this oscillation, the high frequency oscillation, this is transmitted with the saline we use as a matter into ultrasound waves. And with the saline, it is creating micro bubbles that do implode in a very short period of time. And this implosion releases itself energy and this energy is transmitted to the Schneiderian membrane. We know that cavitation is antibacterial. So when you work with a piezotome in crucial areas, you even have an antibacterial um, device in your hands during your surgery. Here you see a very short video that I love to show how the, um, how the cavitation effect is beautifully working here in the sheep skull. Look here inside the sinus. 
this is the Schneider membrane. And what we do is we push like with pauses um, on, the, on the foot switch and you see a beautiful elevation of the Schneider membrane, even if you don't touch it. Important is that we do have enough material medially of the implant. So when I have a remaining bone height of three millimeter left, then this is enabling me to place an implant. If I have less, I would do it in two steps. Like here in this case, here is very little bone, less than two millimeters. We did our infralift. lift, we wait for four to five months, we turn back and then we place the implant. When I do immediate implant placement at that site, and I need to do here, in addition, bilateral augmentation, then I flip here as I was described as the pon poncho technique, one PRF membrane, but you can use a collagen, collagenous resorbent membrane as well upon this augmentated area, and then you wait and let it heal. But the risk reducer number one to avoid ruptures is use something you place prior to augmentation, prior to the initial lift of the Schneider membrane, because this is working as an airbag in the car. You can use collagen, you can use uh, PRF, use something that is resorbable, biological, and that is soft prior to any other step. That's mandatory. We did compare ruptures because ruptures may occur, of course. But the good thing is the ruptures with the intralift are very, very low. And we did a comparison of different techniques with balloon lift, with the Summers osteotome or with the intralift on sheep skulls, an iatrogenic uh, rupture prevention, uh, pre, uh, pre provided by us. And then we compared the rupture length and the rupture width. So if a balloon is, let's say, exploding, then of course the rupture size is pretty big, something between 10, 12 millimeters, 40 millimeters, almost in the pikes. If you cause a rupture with a summer's osteotome inside the Schneider membrane, it might have in this red line here, something between six and probably 10 millimeters. But you see with the intralift technique, we stay below two millimeters. And two millimeters is something that we can handle. This is reducing the risks of failures. And to explain if things might go wrong, but with the necessity of, or unnecessarity to create big uh, manipulation of the bone, I show you this, this, uh, this case. We did a course here, we placed two implants, we created here a nice dome with the intralift technique, but the patient had a massive infection here of this site. Um, she returned back and we did um, a classical antibacterial, anti-biological anti and um, antibiotic uh, therapy for uh, a while. And when she returned back, the whole sinus was clear. You still see here that the Schneider membrane is intact. We have the integrity of the particulate material still there. And we were able to load those implants with ceramic crowns. So this is something that's very important for the users. If things are going wrong, stay cool because you won't create a super drama. Here see another case, uh, particulate material pretty nicely seen immediately and then the conversion into autologous bone four month post-op. And now I show you, and I'm very close to end, um, the very, very difficult case which is, in my opinion, the case that you can only execute with the intralift technique properly. If you look on this 2D scan, uh, let's say view of a 3D scan, this doesn't look so bad. We have here the bone, this is the remaining bone, doesn't look that bad. Here's a little peak. We could manipulate this and you would plan your implant something like here. But that's only the 2D truth. Look at the 3D truth. 
This is the cross section. Look how the bone is going. Here's buccally, this is palatal. The Schneiderian membrane is lying here, but the bone is going in a curve, creating here another mountain, going back into a cavern and going up again and going this way. So if you would do here a lateral window, you would need to go with your instrument all this way and you would end up exactly here where you see the yellow line. This is finito. If you would try to lift, the, this is impossible with, with hand manipulation because you would not see, you would not feel, and you would not reach this area. If you would go with a Summers osteotome in here, this would be very unlikely to manipulate because this is like a U-shaped void of the sinus floor. So a rupture would be very, very likely because you would create very high tension forces here and here. But with the intralift and with the cavitation effect, we can lift off this area due to physics. Look what we did here. This is the same case. You see, we came from the crestal approach. We didn't touch the lateral wall. You see a nice lift off, even if we had and an anatomy that is very, very challenging here in this area, very challenging. But we were able to lift up the membrane properly and to place the implant. Conclusion here is make sure that your, that your patients are ready for bone augmentation, that your patients are ready for implants. And I have to admit that I was not focusing on this topic 10 years ago, but it's so important that your patients have a proper vitamin D level that is exceeding 60 nanograms per milliliter. I love this study from, from very, very famous people, Shukun, Tiziano Testori, um, Patrick Balacci from France, and uh, Shukun, Kuri, that there is two risk factors in bone grafting. A, a high amount of low density lipoprotein, cholesterol, and a low serum vitamin D3. So it's important to check this prior to any big graft. If your patients have, excuse me, if your patients are very low in here, then it's very difficult to achieve proper results. So please do not underestimate these two factors, that low density lipoprotein and serum vitamin D3. And with this, I'm open now for the Q&A session. If you want to get in touch, here is my email address, but you will find me on, on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn as well. And this is a nice proverb by Francois de la Rochefoucauld. He was saying, there is nothing constant in life than change. And with this, I cordially thank you for your attention and I'm ready for the Q&A session.